Yes. Yeah, great. So um, thank you very much um, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to come to, well, to virtually come to, to Bristol again. Uh, my name is Errol Francis. I'm director of Culture And, which is an arts organization based in London. And um, our main aim is to open up the arts and heritage sector to a more diverse workforce and a more diverse audience. Um, I am myself trained as an artist and I did my PhD at the um, Slade School of Fine Art and I'm totally fascinated by museums, that's why I work in the heritage sector and my PhD was about post-colonial artistic re responses to, to museums. So my presentation really much is sort of tied up in the research that I did as well as contemporary events and this is why I've called the title, uh, the, the title of the talk is Breathing um, breathlessness and epistemic violence and I'm going to explain those terms um, in due course um, but um, I really want to highlight the relevance of the issues raised in the recent protest about George Floyd and what is the actual pertinence to the UK heritage sector as well as the ongoing debate about decolonization and, and um, this very much reflects some of the themes that Nicole has just addressed and I think that this is particularly relevant to Bristol because it was the place where, as often happens in uprisings of the people, one issue just kind of slides and morphs into another. In this case, the Floyd um, Black Lives Matter protest, it was, the pro it was the point from where a matter of criminal justice turned into a question around cultural heritage, such as the, the tearing down of the grade two listed statue of George Colston. Um, if you read the event closely, I think what's happening is that a protest about the commission of a murder has become one about the links between heritage and colonialism, and in particular, her, um, historic example of UK heritage, not only commemorating, but failing to deal with its own links with imperialism and specifically the transatlantic um, slave trade. So I want to focus on why the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is relevant to UK heritage. By <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Oh. Sorry, was that, yeah. is that okay? Right. I want to focus on, um, directly by di engaging with the image of breathing and suffocation. This has been a haunting thing for a lot of people, um, for, for me also, this continual reference to suffocation and loss of life, not just as a metaphor, but how it re historically relates to Western museums. In particularly in the British context. This is because there's been globally so much talk about this lack of breath, um, panic, shortness of breath. And as someone who works in the heritage sector, these images of breathlessness have made me wonder what could be the direct connection between museums and violence. And I w want to answer this question. I'm going to answer this question by looking at um, um, so a number of ob objects that are in UK heritage uh, uh, collections and to probe the relationship between heritage and colonial violence and also how that story is told and how we might tackle it. And I'm just going to um, remind ourselves really of these continual barrage of images of suffocation. Uh, not only were the, the words, I can't breathe, the last words spoken by George Floyd as he struggled under the knee of, of, of a police officer. Um, sorry, I should change my slide. Um, um, it was also the final word of Eric Garner in 2014, who died when a New York police officer put him in a chokehold. Both Garner and Floyd said the same words before dying, I can't breathe. Derek Scott can be heard saying he could not breathe as he struggled for air in a police uh, camera footage from 2019 from Oklahoma. Yet again, Javier Ambler in 2019 in Austin, Texas, and Manuel Ellis in Tacoma, Washington, both can be heard saying they couldn't breathe. So I welcome the outrage about the, the murder of George Freud, but institutionally, I think this, as Nicole referred to just earlier, it has tended to take the form of pointing a finger at race relations in the United States that has effectively obscured similar events that have taken place here in the UK. I used to work in the mental health fields and I've been involved in cases where black men have been subjected to violent and fa fatal restraint within the psychiatric hospitals. And there are a number of cases like this, the most recent of which is Sean Riggs, who died 
in a, a Brixton police station. None of the institutions which have stood in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in the UK have mentioned any of these cases. So not only do these institutional expressions of solidarity with Black Lives Matter have in common a failure to recognize their history of similar violence um, perpetrated on people of color, but um, there's been a manifest failure to relate a matter of racialized criminal justice into a question of cultural heritage. For many of the institutions that have rushed to align themselves with Black Lives Matter campaign have within their own history unacknowledged complicity with similar violence. Um, it's one thing to condemn violence by means of law enforcement and it's quite another thing um, to actually recognize specifically how this works in relation to heritage. And um, furthermore, I, I say this uh, because um, many of these institutions have objects in their collection that relate to the profits of slavery and we need to address that. So what I'm gonna say is both a contribution to the debate about decolonization as well as an engagement with the Black Lives Matter campaign. But I want to do this in a way that is directly related to heritage and to analyze actual objects rather than sidestepping it by commenting on what's happened in the, in, in, in the United States. Now, I've, I've mentioned this term, epistemic violence. This is a quotation from the post-colonial writer Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who wrote, Can the Subaltern Speak? And she said, and just to explain, an episteme is a system of knowledge, such as museology, related disciplines like history, archaeology, anthropology. And what I'm going to argue is that the lack of acknowledgement about the links between collections and colonial violence is not only a, a failure of um, curatorial scholarship, but it is in itself a type of aggression. It's, a, it's, it's what I call it epistemic violence. And Spivak says, the clearest example of such epistemic violence is the orchestrated and, and heterogeneous project of constituting the colonial subject of other. And that's what I think some of these collections do. And I'll argue that this epistemic violence is not only suffocating because it denies the cultural breadth of objects and the discursive well-being of post-colonial subjects. It thus becomes an exclusion from history, from theory, ultimately from knowledge. And so what I'm going to show you in the analysis of these objects from the Pitt Rivers Museum and the Bridges Museum, and I'm going to give you a positive answer, uh, a positive example at the end, is the, how this other, othering works in relation to discourse. Um, so let's move on to um, the first object. Um, many of you will know this. They're very, very famous. It's the Benin Bronzes, a collection of some of the most marvelous examples of metal casting in the world, made from the 16th to the 17th century using the sophisticated lost wax method of um, casting and with an astonishing level of detail and artistry. They are a group of over a thousand metal relief plaques that once adorned the royal palace in the kingdom of Benin, in the Edo state of what is now Nigeria. And the British Museum has about 60 of the panels on display in its Africa gallery. In 1919, a German um, ethnographer has said this about the bronzes. He said, these works notably stand among the highest heights of European casting. He said, Benvenuto Cellini, who was the great Italian Renaissance sculptor, could not have made a better cast himself, he says. And no one before or since, even to the present day, has done so. He said, these bronzes stand even at the summit of what can be technically achieved. I mean, they are quite stunning and, 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 good and beautiful. Now in the Edo language, interestingly, there is a word called saima, and it means to remember. And it literally means to cast a motif in bronze. And at the Royal Court of Benin, um, um, art in bronze perpetuates memory. And it was customary when a new king um, came on the throne for a new sculpture to be made um, as part of his father's memorial altar. Now the ancient kingdom of Benin had been in contact with Europeans from the end of the 14th century because of its rich potential for trade in humans as well as co uh, commodities. And the kingdom was ruled by a king called the Oba and in the late 19th century was part of what the British called the Niger Coast Protectorate. So at the end of the 19th century, the kingdom of Benin managed, had actually managed to uh, retain its independence due to its wealth and power. 
And in 1897, after the abolition of the slave trade, the British wanted a, rep a replacement um, in commodities such as palm oil, ivory, and rubber. And they tried to enforce a treaty, but the Oba instructed his people not to cooperate with the British, and he tried to enforce tariffs. Therefore, the re British response was to launch a punitive expedition uh, to force the kingdom into submission. In January 19, uh, 1897, an attack on Benin was launched by acting Consul General James Robert Phillips, but it was ambushed and almost completely annihilated by a, a Benin counter-strike force. In retaliation and revenge, one week later, what became known as the Benin Punitive Exhibition, uh, sorry, Expedition was launched under Rear Admiral Harry Rawson with the explicit mission to completely destroy Benin City and to capture the Oba and send him into exile. What they did next was to uh, torch every single public and domestic building and they completely raised the city to the ground. They then, many, many civilian lives were lost and then what followed was looting by the British army officers on an epic scale with every single item of the city's uh, artistic heritage seized. Some of these objects were given to individual officers, others were taken by the British government to sell to offset the cost of the expedition. A large amount of cultural artifacts was given to the British Museum, some to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, and among these are the Benin bronzes. Now, it, I took my trainees from the New Museum School and that, to see the bronzes, and they were really, really upset by the label in the British Museum, because the label says that the objects were acquired uh, as a result of a war, but it gives you nothing of the horror of the violence that actually took place in the seizing of these, um, th these, these beautiful artworks. And um, uh, I think that what is happening here is exactly what the Black Lives Matter protests were all about, was that the museum in the uh, failure to acknowledge what actually happened appears to be taking sides with those who would do fatal murderous harm to people who are unarmed, who are subordinate, who are regarded as culturally inferior. And to rub salt into the woods, we get this statement by Dr. Hartridge Fisher, the uh, director of the British Museum, posted under a painting by the African-American artist, Glenn Ligon. What the statement says, is the British Museum stands in solidarity with the black community throughout the world. And he says, black lives matter. Well, this is quite astonishing. How can this solidarity be credible or even possible when the museum has in its possession a collective collection of art artifacts obtained through such violence, murder and plunder? How can there be any truth in the statement when the museum continues to hold on to these artworks? And how can there be any truth in the statement that it's engaged in decolonization? So that's one of the examples of what I'm talking about as epistemic violence. The failure, it's not just curatorial um, scholarship that has failed, but there's something there that by failing to give the historic account, this is a classic example of what Spizak would call epistemic violence. Now I want to move on. My next object is from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. And I want you to, uh, it's a garment, and I want you to focus on this mark here, this small little mark here, because there's a whole story about it. Um, uh, amongst many of the controversial items in the Pitt Rivers co uh, collection, including a number, they also have a number of the Benin bronzes, is this object, which is described as a quilted coat known as a jibba. It is a colorful woven cotton garment originally worn by an Ansar. An Ansar was a Sufi Muslim warrior and a follower of El Mahdi in Northern Sudan in the late 19th century. It split down the middle to enable the wearer to um, use it on horseback or on foot. And the description goes on to say, there is a bullet hole in the chest. That's what that mark is up there. And since it is well established that the majority of the Mahdist, who were previously called dervish, that in, the objects related to them in British collections were often retrieved on the battlefield, it's likely that this jibba was taken from a dead soldier after the British rout at Omdurman in 1898. Now, I'm going to talk about Omdurman, but that hole in the chest is quite clearly near the heart, 
and it must have been fatal to the person who was wearing this garment. But the garment was taken by whom? We're told that it was collected by a Harry Hamilton Jackson and given to the museum in 1919. But who was Jackson? It would appear from my own research that Jackson was a, a British army officer. Now, the conflict to which the notes refer is the 1898 colonial battle of Omdurman in Sudan, when the, an army commanded by the British general, Sir Herbert Kitchener, defeated the forces of Abdullah al Taisi, who was the successor to the self-proclaimed uh, leadership of Mahdi um, Muhammad Ahmad, led by Abd Allah, who had dominated Sudan since the British capture of Khartoum in 1885. So this was an anti-colonial struggle, specifically against the Anglo-Egyptian joint rule of the country that continued up to its independence in 1965. The battle was a slaughter. There were 11,000 Sudanese killed, including large numbers of civilians, compared to only 140 of Kitchener's forces. The conflict was the first time that a hollow point expanded bullet was used that had greater accuracy, penetration and damage to soft tissue. So it caused horrific injuries. Now, was this man who was wearing this garment shot with such a bullet? We're not quite sure. There was controversy though, after the battle about the killing of, injured, of the injured and the wounded by the, uh, by the British. So the donor of the jibba, Mr. Jackson, was most probably an army officer. And judging by the historical account, he may well have been the killer of the person who the garment belonged to. And he may have looted it from their corpse. Now compare all of this with the anodyne notes that the museum offers. It's a sanitized account of violence that gives very little historical contextual information to the viewer about the circumstances of the acquisition of the object and how it ended up in the collection. The focus is on the aesthetics of its construction of the garment over the historic circumstances. And it seems like a cold refusal to engage with its humanity, the intangible aspects of the object. So this again is the type of epistemic violence to which I referred earlier. It's a process of othering whose effect is to produce silence, forgetting, alienation. Yet when one considers the military background sur surrounding this object, and the circumstances in which it was acquired, that it may well have been taken from the body of a dead soldier by the person who killed him. Ethically and morally, one wonders whether it should be on display at all. This is again, as with the Benin bronzes, to be a failure of curatorial scholarship, and now seems like a question on morality, and again raises the question of rest restitution. Just to quote the Mazai uh, delegation who came to Oxford recently, they said, the museum should be a place of humanity, not just objects. And I think this particular item brings that out. Now, my final example is meant to be a positive one, but it engages with a very uncomfortable subject. Um, it's a case where a museum has recognized and engaged with violence and suffocation and loss of life. It's an artwork called Restraint, Restrained. It's a video piece, and interestingly, the artist comes from Bristol, her name is Kat Anderson. And the work references the central premise of Franz Fanon's chapter concerning violence in his 1961 book, Wretched of the Earth, in which he claims that in order for the decolonization of the indigenous land to happen, a total and violent purging of the colonizers by the indigenous people must occur. And the artist Anderson repurposes that, this idea to consider how the contemporary black mind and body is a colonized space. And she does this by looking at public health. Now, I mentioned mental health. This film is about an incident in a mental health um, situation. And it, she uses an idea that, that Frantz Fanon suggests, uh, which is combat breathing, which is so relevant to a situation of suffocation where somebody is trying to deny you breath. It's a, tra it's, it's a sort of training similar to free diving, where the diver must make train themselves to hold their breath for long periods to avoid the reflex to inhale in order to survive long periods underwater. And in this analogy, I'm calling attention to the physical endurance needed to survive both within and without the heritage industry, because this struggle is long and it's gonna take a long time. And I think combat breathing is something that you as curators, as museum workers can, can do whatever your role. Anderson's film, 
deals with the killing of a young man in a psychiatric hospital at the hands of nurses who seek to violently restrain him. What takes place is similar to the killing of George Floyd in that the young man appears to pose no threat, is subjected to overwhelming force, and he's, we witness his life draining away. It's very disturbing, but he tries to, but the artist overcomes this horror um, by giving the victim a second life, a one that involves the love and support of his family and community as against the coldness of the medical institution. So when one encounters a work like this, one becomes aware that the reason why objects like the Benin bronzes or the jibba in the Pitt Rivers Museum are suffocating is because they are not only dead, but they are trophies of death. They are loot seized by a colonial enemy as a celebration of defeat, and they're robbed of their original meaning and purpose. Now what restraint and restraint does is restore breath, breathing, and a combative um, sense to a murderous colonial history. And what is even more remarkable about this uh, is that uh, the Welcome Collection, which is a museum, has acquired this work. It's the only known instant that I know of where a museum has acquired a work that not only references violence against black people and aggression that is literally suffocating, um, but that they've done this in a way that addresses the present rather than just the past. And so in conclusion, I would say about these examples, that I hope that I've brought out the connections between museums and the Black Lives Come Out, uh, Matter campaign and in a methodology that really does foreground violence, because that's what the Black Lives Matter campaign was about, and about reinterpreting collections and avoiding the epistemic violence that results from silence, absence and forgetting. I've tried to show the importance of commissioning new work because Kat Anderson's work is a contemporary artwork rather than to just conserving old stuff. Because not only do we need to engage with the present, but we need to point to the future. And this avoids what Stuart Hall described in his 1999 essay, Whose Heritage? The British obsession with the conservation of the past as against engaging with the living culture of the present. This must mean properly dealing with decolonization in all of its dimensions as well as attending to questions of theory and knowledge and indeed interpretation, there is a morality about all of this, as I brought out with the Jibba example. And we should, of course, consider restitution and repatriation of objects where it's untenable for them to remain in their present own ownership. And even the UK Parliament is doing this. And I will end by quoting the curator of the collection in the uh, UK Parliament, who said uh, just this week, she said, uh, her name is uh, Melissa Har Hamlet, we must confront racist history uh, of our collections. The British Empire is part of our story and we have to recognize that many of our collections have racist history. Let's be honest about the colonial and imperial past and look at the slave owning wealth that endowed some of our artifacts. Thank you very much for listening.